Hi everyone! So in this video, I'm going to show you five of the problem solving techniques I use the most often uh, when I try to solve pretty much any coding interview problem. And I'm going to show them to you in the context of trying to solve a specific problem. So let's get started. Okay, so here's the problem we're going to try and solve today. Uh, you're given two integer arrays, for example, these two right here. Uh, you're also given a target, which is just a number. Uh, let's just say that the problem here is uh, writing a function that takes these three pieces of information and returns uh, a pair of numbers that you can make from these two arrays whose sum is the closest to the target. Uh, so in this particular example, you want to be able to find either this pair right here, uh, 3 and 20, or this other pair right here, uh, 5 and 20. And that way, you'd get the sum of either 23 or 25. And that's the closest you can get to 24, because there is no pair of numbers you can make out of these two arrays that add up to 24 exactly. And here, just for simplicity, uh, let's just assume that the two given arrays always have the same length. So let's think about this problem. OK, so whenever I try to solve a coding interview problem, uh, the first thing I like to do is I like uh, to come up with a brute force solution. Uh, in this particular case, a naive brute force solution might be to check every single pair. So that would be this pair, this pair, this pair, and so on. And then this pair, this pair, this pair. And just like that, you can check every single pair. And since there are uh, n squared possible pairs like that, Assuming that the length of each array is n, uh, this solution would take O of n squared in time. So this is just a simple brute force solution, but this might be actually all you need depending on the particular interview. Uh, so what I would do is I would then ask the interviewer something like, uh, you know, this is just a brute force solution, but should I maybe look for a more efficient solution? And if the interviewer says yes, you know, you should look for a more optimal solution, then we can go to the next step. And here's the next step. And by the way, these are actually the steps I personally took to solve this particular problem. Uh, so what I did after you know thinking of the brute force solution is I started thinking of a simpler version of this problem. Uh, you know, as we saw earlier, the problem was to find a pair of numbers whose sum is the closest to the target. So I thought maybe a simpler version of this particular problem would be to find a pair of numbers uh, whose sum is exactly equal to 24. And that's what I started thinking about. And here's the solution I came up with for that problem. Uh, first of all, we're going to initialize an empty set. And then uh, we're going to go through the elements in the first array. And we're going to put all of these elements in this set. And after that, uh, we're going to go through the elements in the second array. And as we do, we're going to check if there's any pair that adds up to uh, the target exactly, 24 in this particular case. So when we're looking at, for example, this number 4 right here, we'll just ask ourselves, uh, is there a number 20 in the first array? And that's easy to check uh, just by checking if there's 20 in the set. And if there is, that's the answer. We can just return 20 and 4. And if not, we can just go to the uh, next element, which is 1 in this particular case. And we can just repeat the same thing. You know, Ask ourselves, is there a number 23 in the set? And if there is, that's the answer. And then just go through the entire array just like that. And this solution uh, would take O of n in time, because we only need to go through each of these arrays uh, just once. And once you have a solution to the simplified version of the original problem, uh, you might actually be able to use the insights that you get from that uh, to solve the original problem. And for this particular case, uh, here's what I thought. Uh, I thought to solve the original problem, uh, we need to just ask ourselves, uh, is there a pair of numbers that add up to 24 exactly? And if there isn't, you know, we just need to ask ourselves uh, the same question with different numbers. Uh, how about you know, 25? And what about 23? And so on. And as long as we keep increasing uh, this range, pretty much forever, I guess, uh, we'll eventually find the right solution. And you know, each of these steps takes uh, O of n in time. So the entire time complexity of this solution would be O of x times n, 
uh, where x is the number of times we need to repeat this procedure in that particular case. And here in this particular case, uh, x is just 2 because you know we will only need to ask ourselves about 24 and then either 23 or 25. And this right here might be actually a pretty good solution. So I would sort of you know repeat the procedure as uh, what I did earlier. You know I would ask the interviewer, uh, I think this is a pretty good solution, but should I maybe look for a different solution? If the interviewer says yes, you should look for a different solution, then we'll go to the next step after this. Uh, for the next step, uh, we're going to use my tip number three, which is to think about the given problem using uh, simple examples, maybe simpler ones than the given example. Uh, using those examples, uh, try noticing a pattern. So as we saw earlier, uh, the given example was this one. You know, it's pretty simple already, but you might want to come up with an even simpler example to make it easier to think about this problem. So that might be uh, something like this, for example. So as you can see, uh, these arrays, each of them has only four elements instead of six. And let's say uh, the target should be 13. And when I came up with this example, I thought, you know, these two arrays are small enough so that it's pretty easy to compute the sum of every single pair. And I thought maybe using that information, I'll be able to spot uh, some kind of pattern. So that's what I started doing. Uh, first of all, I made a diagram like this one. Uh, as you can see, you know, the first array, 7, 4, 1, 10, is right here on the y-axis, you might say, and 4, 5, 8, 7 is on this axis. Uh, you know, I just made this diagram on paper, and then I started computing the sums of each pair, like 7, 4, 7, and 5, 7, 8, and 7, 7, and so on. And then I realized uh, it's probably better to sort uh, these arrays first before computing the sums so that it's going to be easier to spot a pattern. Uh, so that's what I did. Uh, as you can see, each of these arrays have been sorted, uh, 1, 4, 7, 10, and 4, 5, 7, 8. And once I had this on paper, uh, I started computing the sums again. And once I computed all the sums, it was pretty easy to see what the correct solution was in this particular example. Uh, the target sum is 13, so the correct solution would be any of these four values right here. Uh, so, you know, the correct solution would be any one of these pairs, uh, 4, 8, 7, 7, and so on. And when I saw this, uh, the only sort of pattern I saw was that these uh, solution values seem to align themselves in this kind of direction. Uh, you know, that's pretty vague, and I had no idea, you know, if that was going to be useful at all for uh, trying to solve this problem when I was trying to solve it. So I kept thinking about this problem a little bit more. And the next thing I thought was, uh, what if we don't know any of the sums for any of the pairs yet? Then uh, we might randomly check one of the pairs, let's say four and five right here, and you know compute the sum for it at uh, nine. And I realized that as soon as we know that this is nine, we don't have to check this cell anymore. And that's because um, this array right here is sorted. So if you go to the left, in this matrix of sums, uh, this sum right here is definitely going to be less than this sum, uh, 9, whatever uh, this sum is. So we can uh, mark that as definitely not an answer, you know, using let's say x right here. And we can do the same thing for this cell as well. You know, because this array is sorted, uh, if you go up, uh, the sum will be less than 9, which is less than the target. So this sum will definitely not be an answer because it's going to be farther uh, from the target than this sum. So we can mark that as x, that, you know, as not an answer. And we can do the same thing for this cell as well, for the same reason. And after that, uh, we might randomly uh, check this sum, uh, this pair, 7 and 7. And we find that this is 14, of course. Uh, using the same logic, uh, once we know that this is 14, we don't have to check these three cells anymore. And that's because these three cells, if you check the sum, that's going to be uh, greater than 14, which is greater than 13. So these sums are going to be farther from the target than this sum that we checked, uh, 14. Okay, so I think this insight is a little bit more helpful than uh, what we had earlier. But for me personally, uh, 
just having this insight alone was not quite enough to actually uh, start forming a solution. So I went to my next step, which is to use some form of visualization. So we already started visualizing this problem a little bit, but I decided to visualize this problem with a much bigger example, you know, to gain some more insights. Uh, so let's say that these are just like what we saw earlier, the two arrays that were given and these arrays, let's say are already sorted. So these numbers uh, that are represented by Y go up in this direction. That's how it's sorted. And these numbers represented uh, by X go up in this direction. And let's say that the target sum that we're looking for is 70. So with this example, uh, just like we did earlier, we might check uh, a random pair and the sum for it. Let's say we check uh, this sum, you know, this number and this number, whatever they are, and the sum happens to be 60. And once we know that uh, this sum right here is 60, we'll know that we don't have to check these numbers anymore because these sums are gonna be less than 60 which is going to be uh, farther from the target. And the same thing uh, with these numbers and all of these numbers. So at that point, uh, we, can make, uh, we can mark all of those cells as definitely not the answer that we're looking for. And after that, uh, we might check this sum right here. And if the sum of these pairs, this number and this number, whatever they are, happens to be 68, uh, since that's less than 70, we'll be able to tell that we can mark all of these numbers as not an answer. And if we want, uh, we can just keep going like that. Uh, so we might check this sum right here. And if that happens to be 80, which is greater than 70, we'll know that all of these, these cells are not the answer that we're looking for. So let's mark those as not an answer either. And basically we can just keep going just like that. So as you can see, uh, all of these numbers are less than the targets, and all of these numbers are greater than the target. And this blue region and the orange region uh, represent you know, the cells that we don't have to check because we know that our answer uh, doesn't lie in there. So I actually uh, made this kind of diagram on paper when I was trying to solve this problem. And just by looking at it, I thought I'm starting to see you know, the same kind of pattern as what we saw earlier. Uh, so just uh, looking at this black region of possible answers, I thought this region you know, seems to form itself in this kind of shape. And this is you know, kind of similar to what we saw earlier with a simpler example. So just looking at it, I thought you know, maybe we can start from the top right corner of this region and then somehow navigate ourselves uh, through this region to find our answer. And using that bit of insight, I was actually able to come up with my solution for this problem. So let me show you that solution right now. Okay, so let's say we have the same kind of setup as before. Uh, we have the two arrays represented by Y's and X's. And let's say that these are already sorted. We've already sorted them. And you know, Y's go up in this direction and X's go up in this direction. And the target that we're looking for is 70 again. Now to begin our search, uh, we're gonna check the top right corner. And let's say that the sum of that pair, uh, this number and this number right here, happens to be 60, which is less than 70, of course. Then at that point, uh, we'll know that all of these pairs are not the answer that we're looking for. Uh, after that, we can you know mark those as not our answer and check this number. So go down one cell and then check this number. And if that happens to be less than 70 again, let's say 62, we can do the same thing. Uh, mark those cells as not our answer and then you know keep track of uh, this number too. And after that, we're gonna go down one cell again. And if that happens to be greater than 70, let's say 75, we'll know that all of these cells are not the answer that we're looking for. Uh, we can basically, you know, keep going like that. You know, check this number. Uh, if that happens to be uh, less than 70, we're gonna mark these numbers as not our answer, and so on. So just like that, uh, we can, you know, complete our search in this zigzag uh, kind of way. And as we go through that, we can, you know, keep track of uh, 
the pair that we've seen so far, whose sum is the closest to the target. Okay, and once I come up with a solution like that in a coding interview, uh, what I like to do is uh, I like to test my solution on a few examples, and I highly recommend doing this too. So let's say that you know we're gonna test our solution uh, with the example that we came up with earlier, and as we saw earlier, uh, with these two arrays and the target of 13, there were four correct solutions, uh, these four pairs right here. So let's see if we can find you know one of them with this solution. So let's uh, set this up the same way as before. We're gonna you know sort these arrays first, and then you know we can visualize them. Uh, this way. So the first array 74110 uh, is sorted and then laid out here on the y-axis and the second array 4587 is sorted and then laid out on this axis. Uh, the first step of our solution uh, is checking the top right corner so we're gonna ask ourselves okay what's the sum of this pair right here and that's of course 9 you know 1 plus 8 is 9 and at that point because this is less than the target we'll know that we don't have to check these cells anymore. Uh, so after that, we're gonna go down to this cell right here. Uh, what's the sum of four and eight? That's twelve, and that's still less than the target. So we're gonna uh, we're gonna mark these cells as not our answer, and then we'll go down, and then that's fifteen, uh, which is greater than the target. So we're gonna mark this one as not our answer. So we can just basically keep going like that. And then uh, we'll end up going through this kind of path. And if we keep track of you know the first uh, closest target that we see, or the first pair uh, whose sum is the closest to the target, that's going to be uh, this number right here, 12. So from our solution, uh, we're going to return four and eight. And if we want to return you know all of these answers, we can also do that uh, just by keeping track of you know the closest, all of the closest pairs. Anyway, at that point, uh, personally, I would be comfortable enough with the solution. So I would find uh, the time complexity and the space complexity, which happen to be of n log n and of n, assuming that you use an of n log n uh, sorting algorithm. And after that, I would just start coding. And if you're not like 100% sure with your solution, uh, one more technique you can use is you can say something like uh, I'm pretty comfortable with the solution so I think I'm gonna start writing some code and you know try to observe the interviewer's face uh, if the interviewer looks pretty happy like happy enough then you can uh, start writing some code and for this particular solution uh, if you're curious about how I would actually implement it you can check out my solution code in Python and Java at uh, csdojo.io slash problem. Okay, so recently, a lot of people have been asking me for advice on how to get better at problem solving. And honestly, I think the best way is to just, you know, solve a lot of problems and practice a lot. And for that, I actually want to recommend two pieces of resources. Uh, the first one is my Udemy course called 11 Essential Coding Interview Questions and, you know, Coding Exercises. Uh, this course is intended for beginners to intermediate learners. And in this course, I cover 11 of the most frequently asked questions with some coding exercises in Python and Java. Uh, the second one is this website called Daily Coding Problem. Uh, it's actually run by a friend of mine who I used to work with at Google. And what I really like about them is the fact that they provide a pretty detailed solution for each of their daily coding problems. And that solution is actually only available in their premium subscription. But I would say even their free subscription and uh, you know their blog articles are pretty helpful. Anyway, thank you as always for watching my videos and I'll see you guys in the next one.